to Eggplant the Secret Lives of Games. I'm Nick Sudner. I'm here with Andy Nealon. Hello. Doug Wilson. Hey, everybody. Zach, recently vaccinated Gage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we are four game developers who have candid conversations with other game creators that dive deep into the art, craft, and process of making games. Uh, I will say that next week we are doing the final part of our Into the Depths Kentucky Route Zero deep dive mini series. And even if you haven't been listening along, uh, definitely check out that game at some point because it's pretty great. Um, also, some uh, housekeeping, kind of some big news for us is that we're actually launching a Patreon, uh, which should be up by the time you hear this at patreon.com slash eggplant show. Uh, we've just been asked by our listeners kind of since the start about how people can support us financially. Uh, and we wanted to set this up kind of as a tip jar. And to be super clear, it's not something that we need or expect. Uh, this is like a passion project for us. We are all employed. Um, and the show isn't going to change one way or another. And you're not going to be missing out on anything if you don't support us. Uh, but if you do have extra disposable income, um, you know, please support charities uh, first for sure. Um, but after that, if you uh, really want to help us with our show costs, uh, we're super grateful for that. Um, so thanks in advance to anyone who wants to check it out. Um, again, just a tip jar if you love the show and want us to support us, but um, there's nothing extra to be gained by supporting us and the show is not going to change and we're not going to have ads or anything. So, Except um, for our eternal gratitude. Of course, yeah, uh, which is priceless, frankly. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course, telling a friend or reviewing us. In or or, or $5 a like, month. You know, just as helpful or five dollars yeah put a price on it's there. a very specific price actually um <laughs> but uh, yeah so thanks everyone for uh checking that out and if you have questions just tweet at us or uh, email us or anything else um but on our show today uh we are very excited to have uh, diala katan wright the awesome founder of echo dog games and creative director of their very unique uh narrative card game signs of the sojourner hello diala hi thanks for having me on here Thank you very much for joining us. Um, your game launched about a year ago on uh, Mac and PC uh, and more recently came out on all of the consoles, which was uh, very exciting for me because I'm a big console guy and I've been waiting for that. Um, and my bio for you, which please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you created the game with your core team of Holly Rothrock and Zach Vinless, as well as a few external collaborators. Uh, before Echo Dog, you worked as a creative lead at Nix Hydra, and you also have worked as a game designer, uh, doing game design at Nickelodeon. Uh, you worked on a D&D project for Microsoft Surface at Carnegie Mellon, which is very cool. Uh, and you started uh, out doing QA for EA and as a design intern on EverQuest Online. Is that all I Yeah, you you covered it. That is the entirety of my career. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And uh, yeah, for Signs of the Sojourner, it's like a just a, an especially unique game, I think. And, I, you know, I, we used to be a show more focused on uh, roguelikes and um, sort of some more car-driven things at times and um, games like Slay the, Sp Slay the Spire. And we're all uh, tabletop gamers. And I think there's lots of sort of spiritual DNA in here. But I'd love to hear... Uh, you explain the game in your own words um, for people who might not have seen it at all and are just hearing it here for the first time. Yeah, so it's it's a tough game to explain, I think. Um, but it's basically a narrative card game where you're playing cards to have a conversation rather than um, a, a battle or an antagonistic encounter. So you take turns with the NPC playing cards to match symbols, kind of like dominoes, uh, to try to complete a sequence and build a connection with this character hmm. awesome uh yeah it's nice to hear you explain it because i think it's it is like as i've been talking to as i've been playing and talking to friends it's been like every time i feel like i explain it in a different way uh and we have we have lots of questions about sort of the design and uh how you came to that and great some great questions from our listeners too but I also wanted to ask just on that point about explaining it. Um, it, it looks from what I could tell you guys uh, like maybe self-funded the game. You had some Indiegogo support and I saw like the uh, Digerati logo on the game. But generally I was wondering if, if at any point you had pitched it, did you find it like difficult during that pitching process to explain something that's really unique? I think once you played it for like 20 minutes, you get it and it's instantly cool, but that feels like it might be a hard challenge to like bridge that gap in, in describing it. Yeah, so actually, like by the time we started pitching it, we did have a really early demo to share. So hmm. at least we could, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure I ever figured out like a really good, concise way to describe it. But at least at that stage, we could also say like, and here you can just, you know, play it or here's a GIF and you can see how it works. Right. Um, yeah. 
yeah and i mean also just even in terms of like marketing it we kind of ran into that same problem of like how do we describe this you know really concisely <laughs> yeah I, I think for what it's worth I, I i saw it i think it was on like a few game of the year lists last year and the way it was talked about by people like even though i didn't fully understand what it was made me really intrigued and excited to play it so uh i think it, it worked <laughs> but that seems to be a common theme of like yeah i don't know didn't know what to expect but <laughs> yeah but i want to play it um so we yeah we got a sort of a lot of questions about the sort of the core beginnings of this game but um one actually i wanted to ask through this question from our listener icy notes dx uh via our discord said a very simple question for diala where did the idea for science of the sojourner come from though i can look at it objectively and see influences here and there the feeling of playing it was like a bolt of blue what the heck how did they come up with this <laughs> uh so i had kind of been kicking around with different ideas of how to represent conversation and dialogue um outside of, of dialogue trees and kind of your typical, you know, branching um, trees and settling on cards um, was definitely influenced by like playing kind of around that time, like Slay the Spire and stuff and like, oh, this could kind of work. Um, and it, especially the fact that like, I think the kind of randomness and mutability of cards is a good representation for how like, you as a person may be capable of, you know, being really charming or being, you know, super tactful, but like, because of whatever situation, like in that moment, you just, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the natural, like, if you draw a bad hand, like, you know, you're just in a bad situation or in the wrong headspace to express some emotion. Um, so that felt like a good fit for kind of exploring a different way of representing conversation. Hmm. So, so something about the how how the the conversation structure works that's probably worth laying out um, if you haven't played the game is that every conversation you have a hand of cards and they have a symbol on the left side and the right side and the person who you're talking with um, who very much is not your opponent um, also has a hand of cards and they have symbols on the left side and the right side and. When you play a card, what you're trying to do is play a card that matches the right side of, of their last card with, with your left side. So similar um, symbols like dominoes um, and sets them up to be able to match your right side, um, which I think is really a, a, a real shift in um, the kind of experience that you're having from something like Slay the Spire. It was really interesting to me because every every turn you're not thinking about how can i counter the next card or how can i do an action that's really valuable to me although there are actions that come into play in the game really you're thinking how do i play the card that's most likely to be something that the computer can play like how can i think about this person i'm talking to and set them up to be able to continue this conversation and i thought like that was a really unique mechanic there are some cooperative card games that have similar things but how, was that part of the the idea of of a conversation um, from the beginning when you were trying to design this card game? Like, how did you come to that sort of collaboration component? Yeah, it was from the start. We wanted something that could, you know, represent these collaborative conversations. And like you say, like, I think just about everyone starts off playing like, okay, well, I just need to worry about matching my cards. And then they have that moment where they realize, like, they also need to anticipate what the other person's going to play and kind of accommodate that. Um, and yeah, we went through a lot of iterations that felt very combative and um, we just weren't capable of of kind of capturing a collaborative moment. Um, and so yeah, our ultimate goal was, you know, it would be nice if we can also kind of have, have a system that handles both antagonistic conversations and, um, you know, collaborative ones. But really being able to, you know, the collaborative side of that was the most important and not making it feel like you know, a reskinned combat system kind of thing. Was there like a moment in the design when you hit upon the system that you felt like, oh, this is the thing that we're going to go with? Like, what was that process like of working through those different systems? Yeah, so we, gosh, it was like six months of going through different prototypes and trying out different ideas. Um, and we had reached this point of like, you know, we've spent so long on all of these different iterations and like none of them are getting there. And this was like, those are like the dark days where it was like, okay, we need to just you know, take a step back. Like everything, all the kind of tropes we've been working with, all of the um, 
you know, ideas we've been exploring, like, just take a step back, go back to, like, literally, like, pen and paper, and, you know, from all the lessons we've learned about what didn't work, like, try to kind of start fresh. Um, and it really, I mean, a big part of it was simplifying everything enormously, um, and actually also abstracting things a lot, where uh, our earlier versions had a lot of kind of very, you know, cards represented very literal um, actions, and we tried to, like, model conversations in a more realistic way, which is super difficult. <laughs> and uh, once we kind of, yeah, simplified and abstracted things, it just really kind of clicked and came together really quickly after that. Some Something I always encounter um, when I'm working on card games is it really, I, I feel like I have trouble feeling confident about a mechanic unless the mechanic in and of itself is fun. And I feel like in your game, the matching is really good and it fits so well with the system that you're building. But a lot of the places where it fits so well aren't just within the mechanic itself. It's like how that mechanic is used and how it is structured um, throughout the game and how the different systems like all overlapping interact with each other. Um, and I, I don't want to get too far into like what those systems are, but there's some really beautiful stuff that comes out of this that's really thematic and amazing how did you know like did you come up with all of that stuff together when you hit, hit upon this mechanic or did you sort of have this matching and be like oh this is like we we just know that this is going to work and then start thinking about those other systems um it did it did kind of come together really quickly once we figured out the matching and that was immediately like from our you know proto uh paper prototypes we're like, oh yeah, this this is it. Like this, we like, like we finally figured it out. Like this is clearly the way we need to go. Mm -hmm. um, but things like uh, the initial structure of the game wasn't this loop where you return home. Um, but as soon as we were like, okay, you know, you have to exchange a card every time, it became clear that like returning home and seeing, you know, holding yes. up your your hometown <laughs> and your friends as this contrast to your own changes was like you know, this just highlights that so much better than if it was like a linear map traveling out into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of those things, like I said, just came together really quickly once we had those core mechanics in it down. Um, it was just like, okay, this clearly like enhances everything about that concept if you're returning home and seeing the changes. Yeah, that that um, that moment that you just alluded to is like, I think, like almost like a like a staggering moment when you encounter it. And I know Andy had written some notes about that in the show as well. It's just like this, uh, to, to summarize it, I mean, I guess this is a bit of a spoiler, but like um, everybody in the game has different symbols. And so as you go out in the world, you learn these new symbols and you modify your deck to be able to interact with different kinds of people. Um, and you generally have to do that by failing to interact with people. And like whether you like quote unquote win or lose a conversation, you always get to exchange a card. And so you can build and adjust your deck in this really cool way because it's like, oh, I tried to interact and I got shot down, but I'm going to try again and I'll work with these different people. Um, and then you finally get home and the people in your town who were so easy to interact with and the start of the game are now really hard to interact with because your deck is filled with all these symbols that they don't have. And it's, uh, I mean, I guess I've, I feel like I've played a lot of games that tried to hit upon this feeling of like going out into the world and changing and I don't think any of them worked as well as this. This is like really amazing. And it also feels like something that like I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. And then you get there and yeah, I don't know, Andy, what you're, what you're feeling. I mean, I didn't, that part that's the part that, I mean, that's where it really clicked. Like the first return home. So without spoiling too much, you're going on, I think throughout the course of one playthrough, you're going on five uh, journeys um, and when you come home from the first journey, like the game starts off very benign. Like it's like you're very, it's, it's like you're com it's like you, you're a person who's grown up there. You're in your comfort zone and it's like, oh, this is really cute. Like the first thing that struck me about the game was that the UI and all everything about like interacting with the, with the game is like really beautiful and very thoughtful and everything explains itself through like little animations and you just get it, right? So it's like, it's a pleasure to just interact with it. But you, you know, you're just getting the story and there's, it's not, the system itself exposes itself, but not through being challenging. But then when you come back home, <laughs> you've gained all, you've basically grown and shrunk at the same time, right? Because the mechanic, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Diala, I think when you, 
uh, have a successful interaction. And again, I don't know if this is the proper terminology, so please correct me, right? Like when you get through like all the white speech bubbles, I think that's when you're allowed to like get something from the other person and lose something from the past, right? Uh, yeah, well, you actually, you get that opportunity no matter what. No matter what? Okay, okay. Unless yeah. like you they don't have a chance to play a card before Got you it. get this. We call it concordance and discordance, but yeah, like okay. it's based on the cards they play. So if, you know, you, if the, if the conversation goes south before they even say anything, like, yeah, in that, that case, you don't get anything. Cause I feel like I had a situation where that happened pretty bad. And again, that would be a spoiler. So I don't want to give it away. But the thing, yeah, you come back home and the thing that I'm used to from the hero's journey is, and this is in a, in a lot of Miyazaki films, like you see, like you come back to your place of origin and you see how you, you see all your growth, right? It's always like, oh yeah, now I've outgrown this place and it's always bittersweet, but it doesn't linger on it too long. But in this, that's, it's like the essence of it. Like you come back home and it's like, oh my God, this is not only positive. Like it's there's now suddenly the people I want to talk to are like, I don't, what are you saying? Like, I don't get it because you have this mechanical mismatch which I thought was fascinating. It was like, I wrote, it was an, it was an emotional and systemic gut punch. Right. <laughs> Where I was just like, at that point you had me and I was going to, I was going to play like irrespective of the fact that I was playing it for the show. I was like, this is the point where I would say to my students, I will play your game all the way to the end because now you have like really hooked me with this, with what's going on. And I really want to see how the story plays out. Hmm. And I thought it was amazing. And I'm, and I, here's, here's Andy not having a question within, <laughs> within this. Right. But like, I wonder, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder if I wonder, I actually, no, I can change this into a question. I wonder, was that a thing that just clicked with with you as the designer like did you nail that after the system worked because that feels so hard like i was like oh my god this sounds this seems so difficult to get that just to feel just right Right. yeah so from the very start like before we even kind of figured out these core systems um we knew we wanted to kind of explore themes of travel and um you know all kind of all the different reasons why people travel whether it's for school or work or Um, as an immigrant and so all of those earlier iterations we had gone through kind of exploring like different angles of what does it mean to travel what does it mean to kind of find a new home and settle down someplace or you know build a new home yeah so once once we had this uh you know exchanging cards it it it's hard to like I I didn't know it was going to work so well. I don't think any of us did. But once we kind of tried it out and it was just like one of those like, well, okay, now we got our core system. Like this will just be the first thing we try. You know, we'll see how it works. And it was like, oh, wait, this actually really works. Like this is the game now. Um, And yeah. That's cool. I I wish I had like more of a, yeah. Well, because the abstraction works, like you said, you, you said you abstracted it, right? And the abstraction works so, like in my... It's an abstraction. It's a system. Usually like that's some reduction of human complexity because that's what games are often. But I find that abstraction to be extremely fitting, right? Like all the little nuance of like decide, like everything in the system of like you, you gain a card, you have to decide what you're, what you will leave behind because you only have, I think you're always, you always have like the same set size of card minus the fact that you also add in fatigue cards later. And I was like, I thought that's so smart. It's like yeah, you you can't you can't just gain things without leaving stuff behind. And I was that, like that that element too of like forcing you to ditch a card and gain a card after every round that feels like a very bold choice because it sort of forces you to not just like you know you try to like build a certain deck and then sit on it. You you really have to change things up throughout, and that feels like that I feel like that takes a specific sort of like confidence or assumption of like all right, I'm gonna this is gonna be like good for the player long term but they're gonna have to like really get used to it because even in the ui it's like once you choose the one you want to get rid of you're committed to it and you have to choose one after every interaction Uh, yeah i mean that was like what we did was so like that actually the like choose choose a card and leave a card was actually just like placeholder text that we were like okay we'll try this out like for right (laughs) now you can't like decline to gain a card um and then once we started playing with it like that was one of those things that like at no point did we ever discuss like, well, maybe we should actually change that. It was like, clearly this is working. We're keeping that. Um, I mean, it got so far that I stopped there were, and it made me, so the, I'm going to tell a little story of what happened without spoiling anything in the story. There were moments in the game 
where I was pursuing a specific conversational goal with very specific people because I wanted to see the outcome of what felt to me like one branch of the story. And it got so far that I stopped talking to available con conversations because I did not want to lose my current voca my current vocabulary. <laughs> And it was weird. I was like, oh my God, this is not me at all. Like I love talking to like pretty much anyone because I feel I have something to gain. But in this specific moment, I was like, I want to go down this one specific path. And I found it difficult if I have, if I've gained traits from other characters. Yeah, that's actually one area that, um, like, I don't know how we would have allowed you to talk to everyone without kind of undermining, you know, that whole thing. But that is, I think, one area where kind of, like, the metaphor that falls apart, where, like, or the message kind of gets lost, where it's, you know, with, we don't want to be a downer on, like, oh, you shouldn't be broadening your horizons kind of thing. <laughs> but on the other hand, like, it's kind of necessary for that core focus of the game. Well, your friend, like, you have a very good friend in the game. Your player character has a good friend from home. Uh, Elias, I think, is is their name. And Elias says at some point, I think I actually wrote it in the show notes, I quoted it, uh, something like, of course, now I'm not going to find, oh, uh, my, my friend Elias keeps reminding me that I can't please everyone, right? And I was like, it felt like there's like a, when I, when I read that, I was like, I think that's the designer telling me something. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think it's, I mean, either a gamer thing or just like a natural human thing that pretty much every player, like we were seeing, wanted to talk to everyone, wanted to go everywhere. And no matter kind of what sorts of more subtle hints we dropped or tried to kind of direct them to like, yeah, you know, you should probably specialize and think about who you're talking to. Like, it just, no, like they were going to talk to every single character and get really upset about failing. I mean, that's um, definitely how like, I started. Literally, yeah, I had characters telling you like, don't do that. <laughs> but of well, course, people still do. <laughs> I mean, I definitely started that way because I tried to build, you know, I, I don't, I, I went in with no, I, ne I read nothing about it. Uh, and I was like, oh, let's see if I can have my cake and eat it too, right? Let's see if I can have like this all like the the omni the omniscient presence who like knows a little bit about everything because the I'm blanking on the name of the leader of the caravan the right Dean. now, right? So that character has you see this early on when you talk to them, right? Like has like double symbols on the card, so you're like, oh. Maybe you can even, so at that point I'm thinking, oh, maybe I can even have triple or quadruple symbols and you can become this like, and of course I failed miserably in doing that um, and then realized maybe I need to focus. But all of that felt very, very natural, right? None of that felt forced. And I actually didn't get the feeling that, you, that I was limiting myself in some way because it felt like the characters that I was not as good at interacting with were also characters that I was not as honestly, it didn't feel like there was antag they weren't antagonistic, but they felt a little bit antagonistic, not so that it felt competitive, but I was just like, mm, this is a little bit too much in my face right now for the character that I feel like I'm role playing. And you're anyway, you're reminding me, uh, Andy, we have uh, another good question from uh, Jonah SRG via Twitter. You said, I'd love to know about the chicken and egg relationship between character writing and card interactions where any character is written in adherence to specific card and ability combinations or vice versa. If you can tell us a bit about that process. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it was a lot of kind of back and forth. Um, for the most part, a lot of the characters kind of started with just, you know, kind of summary briefs of what what they're all about, what their kind of concerns are, what the relationships are. Um, and then we'd kind of like slot them into the towns where like their personality kind of seems to match what shapes and what th those towns are all about. Um, but for the most part, I mean, we, we had started and we had quite a few characters in kind of towns um, in our early versions before we actually had a writer come on. Mm. And so, of course, once they started really fleshing out these characters, bring them to life. It was like, okay, let's go back and revisit the decks and tweak those a bit. Um, there were a couple instances where it was like, okay, we want, you know, kind of driven by the mechanics where it's like, okay, this is going to be a bit of more of a puzzle to solve. And you're going to have to like approach it in a really specific way. Um, so we have a couple characters like that, that started with like, here might be like an interesting deck to play against. Mm. Um, but because those also tended to be like a lot more difficult, um, we made those. We only have like a couple of those, and they're not 
like super central to the story because hmm. it's more of like a puzzle to solve. Right. Um, and then there were a few things like, for instance, um, one really useful card, Accommodate, uh, which like duplicates the previous card. Only your best friend Elias has that. Um, and early on, like a bunch of different characters had that. And it was kind of like spread all over the way a lot of the other ability cards are. Um, and on the one hand, like having too many of those cards in your deck is really powerful. So we wanted to um, reduce, you know, your opportunities to gain that. And then from the character side, it's like, well, okay, having your best friend be the only person to give you that card just really makes sense. And then that way also, like, no matter how much you don't want his other cards, like, at least there's, you know, there's this one reason to always talk to him, both from the story side and, like, mechanically. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the only place you can get this really useful card. One thing that I was really struck by with the um, mechanics and the text interaction was that so in that moment when you uh, return home for the first time and you're talking to Elias and um, you're sort of stumbling over your words because uh, you've got you've changed and it's difficult to interact with him, you're coming home after having failed to have conversations with people on the road. And typically on the road, you don't know those people at all and they get upset with you if you fail a conversation. But Elias is really giving and he'll say things like oh you must be tired from the road or like um you know like he knows that he has this different kind of relationship with you and he tells you that even as you fail like the fail states are are a totally different kind of thing um and i feel like that kind of writing is really hard to get in games because typically when you're writing you are out of context in the way that the things are happening um, whereas that writing is like directly understanding all of the mechanics that are surrounding it and interacting and reinforcing the things that the mechanics are reinforcing. And I was just wondering if you had like any particular ways that you worked with the writers or like a particular process that we're using to make sure that the writers um, in the game understood how all of those pieces were going to work together. I was going to ask that exact question as a, as, as a <laughs> game writer because it, it, it's no, it strikes me as like a huge challenge, and I'm I was super impressed with the results. So yeah, I echo Zach. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's actually one area where going more abstract helped us a lot. Like again, in those earlier versions, we would have like after you played a card, you know, to either your literal dialogue or like just a description of events would show up, and like yeah, getting that to match what you expected when you played that card was super difficult um so by kind of adding this abstract element and removing your own character saying anything um it really helped because players kind of fill in the gaps so like you know elias that's his character like he's going to be understanding he wants to you know um remain friends with you and so like it doesn't really matter what you play that causes, or which one of you causes the mismatch or anything like he's always going to kind of be supportive and understanding um you know other characters might kind of like you know think that you're being rude or uh just depending on the personality like you know other other characters who are fond of you will again you know be very understanding of your mismatches um and so i mean there actually wasn't like as long as we had different, you know, um, text for uh, the ability to set it for, like, if you cause a mismatch versus the other character caused the mismatch, and some of them will kind of react differently, um, either defensively or, like, dismissive of you, depending on who did that, on who caused the mismatch. Um, but for the most part, it was like, okay, you know, just kind of, this is just true to that character's personality and the, like, that connection of this card causes this dialogue, um players just kind of fill in the gap with that and like mm -hmm. there wasn't a ton of like behind the scenes stuff that work that we had to do to make sure like that always made sense i have another question about the the mismatches um so just to describe for the listener you depending on the conversation you have like um you might only have two mismatches before the conversation's over or three mismatches or and you might have to get um three correct sequences to get through the full conversation or only two correct sequences or whatever that is. i was curious like my game developer brain was like wondering as i was playing through some of these conversations how much how much mismatch content did you feel you had to put in like and how conditional is some of that system like so you know you hear one of the successful sequence, like part one of the conversation, 
and then you mismatch twice or you got through the first two parts of the conversation and then you mismatch like did you feel a lot of pressure to have um because that, that seems like it would be infeasible from a dev perspective to really have like a very particular response to every possible sequences of matches and mismatches like what what how did you go into that like what was the right balance there in terms of where the mismatches would happen in the flow of the conversation yeah so that was actually one area where i mean if if we had had unlimited time i would have loved to kind of flesh out those discordant conversations to be like just as um you know, relevant to the story as the concordant conversations. Cause a lot of them are just kind of like, you know, okay, this, you know, this conversation fell apart and there's not a lot that, um, you know, drives the story forward there. Um, that was just due to, you know, resources, but in terms of kind of spacing out the mismatches like that, we actually started really simple where it was just, you know, for each black box, we just have, you know, one, one mismatch line that we'll play in. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, the mismatch is the first thing you get, or, you know, you have three Mm. successes and then a mismatch. Um, And of course, once we started kind of playing through that, we'd find a lot of conversations where um, it, it was just like, this felt like this huge non sequitur where like the, the, the NPC would refer to something that like you'd been talking about several sequences before, or um, something that like the matching hadn't actually reached yet. And was like responding to something that hadn't actually happened yet. And so then on a case-by-case basis, we'd go through and um, write either extra lines or just kind of add conditionals so that certain lines only appear if you've had so many matches um, to give it the context to make sense. But yeah, we really started with like the bare minimum and then just on a case-by-case basis where it needed it, did we add these extra conditionals to kind of you know smooth it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that still sounds like a huge amount of work. <laughs> um uh it was a lot of writing (laughs) yeah we had a we had a question uh, on twitter from jeff bandy who said i'd love to hear uh more about how diala thought about player guidance and fail states while planning the game once i hit trip four i couldn't successfully finish any conversation with the hand i'd built and had to put the game down because i was so frustrated but uh jeff loved the art and music so yeah how much uh, as far as like actual fail states did that did you think about that in this game and was that ever a, a thing like could you could you lose yeah, that was it's that was definitely something that I've been kind of second guessing myself on throughout the whole process where like we knew that we didn't want um you know the the story would the game would keep going the story would keep going even if you failed these conversations. We tried to avoid calling them failed conversations, but like they are. <laughs> um and so a lot of it came down to like you know, trying to anticipate, like, okay, most players are going to try, on their first play, going to try to, you know, do the kind of generalist, pleasing everyone run, and um, that's probably not going to go very well for them, so, like, where can we kind of remind them, or push them towards, you know, kind of deep diving into a specific storyline, or into a specific region, symbols. Um, And it was one of those things where, like, you know, we knew there'd be a good amount of failure required to, you know, move into a new region and start getting those symbols or, um, you know, just by the nature of the game, like you're going because other characters move around too. like, even if you're specialized into a certain town, you know, someone from a different region might show up there and you won't really have the cards to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those things that, like I said, I was kind of, second guessing like is this too difficult do we need to make it too you know a whole lot easier and of course we did you know balance it to be a bit easier from from what it originally was but in the end it's one of those things where um you know obviously it's not great that you can kind of dig yourself into a hole and it can be um pretty difficult to kind of adjust your deck to be able to be successful again um i think you know some some level of that is like okay, this just isn't the game for you if you want to be able to please everyone. Right. Um, you can't, you can't min-max uh, relationships. <laughs> yeah, but also, you know, that's... No one wants to hear that, like, oh, yeah, this game was so frustrating, I couldn't finish it. Um, and that's... Yeah, I we clearly didn't quite find the balance there, but I think in the end it was, you know, stick to our guns and keep it about this... Yeah um you know this journey <laughs> not not to minimize this like listener's experience but I, I i just want to emphasize i really appreciate that you stuck to your guns there like for me 
um, games really need stakes, and and that can mean a lot of things, but stakes to be meaningful. And I it it because I've been working on narrative games recently. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about. There's like a lot of moments where narrative games feel like a chore. Right, like you enter a town or a scene, and it's like, "Yep, I gotta slurp up all the content. I gotta talk to everyone and do all the things." And then that like suddenly changes the game from like, "I'm really interested in the story" to like, "Ah, oh, God, I have to do my algebra homework." Right, and and I think that this is like a major. Uh, I, I feel like less talked about problem often in narrative games, and so I, whenever I have difficult choices or constraints in these kinds of like conversation based games i really appreciate that because it it's not that i it necessarily need the mechanic because i'm all about mechanics or what it's it's almost like the opposite which is just like i needed that so that i don't feel like i have to do my homework or something so like like it, I, I don't know how that's like seems like an impossible balance like once you add that possibility for failure there probably will be people no matter what who kind of like fall into the failure trap but I, I guess the question is like, what percentage of failure is okay to make that richer experience for the eighty percent of us or whatever who like, kind of do get through it? But uh, at least speaking for me personally, selfishly, uh, that was one of my favorite things about the game. Um, more narrative games with these like difficult choices that prevent me from vacuuming up all the content. Hugely, hugely enjoy. It. Yeah, I think also the the tension of it added. Um, something really significant for me, like you were saying that you started with this game as a paper prototype, which I imagine were you like playing each other? Like one of you had a deck of cards and the other one had a deck of cards and you were working together to match them. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes that sometimes like literally just playing against myself and testing out ideas. Um, hmm. So I imagine if that was the case, then maybe when you bring it to the computer, there's a difference, right? Because you're not trying to vibe with an actual human. You're trying to work with this computer who has a bunch of cards that's random. And to me, the tension that was in the game as not having the right deck for someone was part of what made it really feel like a cooperative experience. Like I was working with a person who had you know, a set of things that they could do and I could do my best to collaborate with them. And I was wondering if when you when you took that leap from having this be this um, paper experience where you're working with yourself or working with somebody else to changing it into being a game where you're working with a computer, were there things that came up in terms of you trying to make it feel more like like the paper prototype where you were trying to like vibe with a specific person where there like mechanics or things that you tried to adjust to get that feeling or did, did it just sort of have it right away? Yeah, there wasn't too much adjustment needed. I mean, um, as we kind of thought up and introduced new of those special ability cards, like some of those um, and started also attaching like the kind of, what does what does this ability mean to have like personality wise and kind of starting to distribute those um trying to match the character's personalities and really trying like kind of all of these elements working towards highlighting you know the character and and expanding on characterization um but yeah i wouldn't say there was like a huge jump from paper prototype to uh digital hmm. um and we also made that really quickly though like we were Sorry, we were like amazing, you know, a, a couple days of wow. like paper, and we're like, yeah, we <laughs> this is good, like let's go. <laughs> I feel like so often we interview people on this podcast, and then we're like, how did you do this incredibly complicated thing? And like everybody is always like, you know, it just worked, it just worked right away. <laughs> that is no a problem. through line in this show. That is a through line in the show where it's always like, oh, we just we made it, and then somehow we stuck with that that worked really well. Well, it's like, but it goes with like everyone we talked to also had to just make a lot of things for a long period yeah. of time, and then you've and then you right, sort right. of find it's the never that simple. Yeah, that, that was worked. After right, six and, months of things not working. Right, right. and then yeah. that's the thing we interview you about. So it's <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a it's a clear good trajectory. But um, Andy, I know you had a couple um like uh sort of different. I, I, well, I was going to ask Diala like what uh game what other games have maybe influenced signs because i'm really curious about that too especially in other narrative dialogue systems but i know you had a couple of like tabletop things called well that too, i, I want to talk about the tabletop area. things but first i want to yeah. go back to something that doug just mentioned um i think i actually think it's great that doug brings in these qualifiers of like in my like in his opinion so in my opinion and with my personal experience i was able to 
dig myself into a hole, but also like the game was long enough to like course correct. So I realized that quickly. And then for some moment I was like, oh, is it, is it, am I, you know, as a designer, you're always like, am I playing this right? Am I, should I be going down and then down one specific path? And then you saying that you actually wanted that, like, it was like, oh, great. I feel like I got the full experience. So I feel like you balance it. I, I, like, I'm in total awe, right? I'm smitten by the fact <laughs> that you were able to balance this so well that I had this like, oh no, this is not a good idea. Like this whole life experience. Right? It's like that Star Trek episode where Picard goes through a whole life in like the blink of an eye. And I'm like, and so I feel like I had that in a small version. Um, and, and to, you know, the question here, because <laughs> I'm always like the person who's just like going to praise you, but the question here is, and again, this goes back to how you're having the characters tell you things about the world. One of the characters I met, I forget, again, don't know who this was, might've been like a side character at some point says to me, oh, the, the caravan leader, I, she's really intimidating. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I was feeling. I was like, because I again, you're like, I'm still like this bumbling person who has like some somewhat like not a, an amazing deck with not a whole lot of abilities yet, and and Nadine has the, all this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, and and her the way she, it comes across in her conversation is also like, yeah, you like it's a person who's like been around and had a lot of experience. So both the writing and her overall ability is together made me feel intimidated in a four to five hour game so i just thought that was fascinating and i wonder did you know this like when you wrote the character saying oh i'm intimidated by her did you know that i was going to feel intimidated both on a story and on a mechanical level because um, i did i was <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh yeah i mean we you know we knew that nadine would be this intimidating you know rough around the edges but like has some kind of softness for you and your mom um and again like that that was a lot of back and forth of like you know as as her character gets more fleshed out like let's tweak her deck and her conversations to kind of reflect that and then you know oh but like for balance reasons we need to change her deck this way so like okay let's go adjust the character a bit to match that change um it, it, yeah it was a lot of kind of like back and forth between the, the mechanics and the deck design and then the actual writing uh i tip my hat it's a it's a huge <laughs> it's a huge design a feature a feat right to, to overcome that um but the thing that nick was guiding me towards i think is more like uh i used to be a huge i'm still like i still like deck building games like dominion and all the like the classic tabletop deck building games um but there was a time when i was like very in love with them like Nick and Doug and I and a couple of others, I think even Zach were playing Ascension for years, right, on on, on our phones. Um, and I even wrote an article about my love of deck building games. And the one game I played there that I really thought stood out was a Friday. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. It's, I don't know that one. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the big difference between Friday, which is a single player deck building game where you're trying to be like, you know, Robinson Crusoe on an island and survive. So it's very much a survival game. The world's trying to like beat you down. It has like two, it's, it's relatively complicated, but it's beautiful in how it tries to do what you're doing, which is modeling like the way you would interact with this island. But because you're not, because you're, the story there gives itself a lot of leeway because it's only, it's only one person, right? You're not actually having dialogue options. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if there were other inspirations, like the other game I can think of is Consentical. By Naomi Clark. I don't know if yeah, I, I'm probably pulling I've heard of that one, but yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned you mentioned Fog of Love as your notes too, Andy, which I which I've played, and I think that out of any tabletop game I've played gave me sort of a similar sense of having this like interesting relationship with your partner who you're playing it with. So Fog of Love. Have you ever played that, Diella? No. So wow. it's actually yeah. so Fog of Love is just very is a very much more mechanically complicated version. Right, which I personally, I think Zach and I played that at GDC a couple years ago. Right, Zach, I think didn't yeah. Quins make us yep. play that? And I think he that did. neither of us were like very. We were, I don't think we either of us like really loved that game, if I recall correctly. It was interesting. I feel like I'm surprised that neither of you are bringing up Hanabi. For me, this game really felt like like it had linkages to Hanabi. Is that one you've played? That is a one I have played. Yeah, and actually. <laughs> It wasn't, I don't know that we ever, like, thought of it while we were working on this game, but I played it with Zach, the programmer, like, a few times, and yeah. um, 
yeah, now that you mention it, like, oh yeah, we probably should have looked at that <laughs> more closely. <laughs> well, I think I think you did look at it. It just like it was like a subconscious. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, what I guess what what games uh, or experiences do you feel like more consciously influenced you guys? What other things did you look at? Um, so it's actually very few like physical card games. Um, we played, you know, early on we were looking at this was like when Slay the Spire was at its height of popularity. So looking at that, um, Hearthstone. Uh, Dream Quest, which was kind of like the Slay the Spire precursor, mm-hmm. um, and just so many card games that didn't really actually end up having a whole lot of influence. Um, but a lot of those like kind of lent to our early iterations being like much more complicated and um, much more kind of. It ended up being really difficult, I think, for players to pay attention to both like really complex card game and also pay attention and care about a story. Um, and for us, it was like, okay, clearly like the story is the more important thing here. So let's like strip back all that complexity. And yeah. Yeah. I feel like those would have suffocated the story, right? Yeah. I, I cannot believe you got here from Slay the Spire. Like I never would have put this <laughs> in that lineage. It feels, it feels more to me like, uh, I mean, cause we're playing through Kentucky Road Zero right now on our mini series that I mentioned up top and which has some really interesting ways of handling dialogue choices and its implications on the story. And uh, like what other, I guess, you know, are there other uh, na- sort of more narrative driven games that. Uh, yeah. So I'd say um, a big one was definitely 80 days and how, you know, it's of course all about travel and exploring new, pla- new places. Um, and, you know, these NPCs with lots of agency. Uh, and that was, I think probably, you know, the biggest influence um, cards aside uh, and we looked at a lot of other games kind of with themes of travel um, and kind of visiting places uh, like Sunless, Sunless Sky, Sunless Seas um, has a bit of that. And of course, these games are very different from ours, but like just how how they represent, you know, going to a new place, encountering new cultures or, you know, different kind of local concerns. Yeah. Um, Della, I wonder, I'm just like thinking through this uh you know, when we're talking about like, wow, how did this come from Slay the Spire? I, I mean, Slay the Spire, right? It, it is a single player, but the opponent isn't using the same kind of deck mechanics as you, right? And I think to me, that's a huge difference that this is a co-op deck building game. And there are not so many co-op deck building games. Me and Andy were just talking about, um, I play Arkham Horror card game pretty seriously. It's kind of like a co-op netrunner. But it, even there, I just I think there's something powerful about taking one of these games but making it co-op. Um, it's not the fact that it's a single player; it's the fact that you're playing with these AI players who are playing with the same rules as you. Um, but co-op totally flips everything on its head. Like earlier, Andy was talking about the fact that Nadine could intimidate him by playing all these advanced cards on like day one. And that, that like co-op somehow lets you do that kind of almost imbalance because it's like, okay, that your partner who you're playing with is like much more powerful than you. Cause you're not competing against them. And then that lets you do all these cool narrative and metaphorical things. So I like, I, I, I did you, I guess my question there is, did you at, at some point, influenced by slay the spire were you thinking that it would be a little bit more asymmetrical like the ai opponents would kind of cheat and play by a different mechanic or throughout the whole way were you like no they're also going to have five cards and have to kind of play the same game as as you're playing um so again like in those earlier iterations we had some versions where uh you know it it was asymmetric and um some versions were like it was mainly just you kind of like playing cards to collect points of some kind and, um, or more of like kind of solve a puzzle. Uh, but, and possibly because we started, started with a paper prototype for this symbol matching. Um, it's like, well, well, first of all, this only works if you both have symbols to match. Uh, but again, we wanted to be able to have these exchanges that, um, you know, could feel really high stakes, but not necessarily be combative. Um, and so f- for that, it was, you know, having, being able to have, like you say, characters who um, have really advanced decks or um, kind of express their character by like, 
you know, having endless chatters and they just talk and talk and talk. And like, these aren't things that would be antagonistic, but it can't like, it can kind of add stakes of, you know, is this someone I can, you know, communicate with? And um, what does communicating with this, what does, you know, successfully connecting with this person actually mean? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's, there's definitely some characters that like, and I think we could have pushed this further, but as you talk to them, get to know them, like maybe you, this isn't someone you want to get along with. Maybe this, you know, this is someone you wouldn't want to connect with and, and build a relationship with. Um, and so kind of adding stakes through that rather than it all being very combative and like life or death kind of situations. Yeah. Uh, I do want to talk a little about the world of the game as well, but one other uh, question while we're kind of in, still in the realm of like deck building and such here that we got from Hanamo via discord said, and it's kind of a question for everybody. I think um, are roguelikes with deck building inherently more approachable than games with similar mechanics. I really love Slay the Spire, for example, even though I'm not really a card game player, Thinking about that versus Hearthstone, for example, the way the complexity ramps up over a run enabled me to really think about how adding this or that would interact with the systems I already had in my deck. Do you agree? And do you think this is one of the reasons roguelikes, especially deck building ones, have gotten so popular? Or is this nonsense? So maybe as this applies to Signs of the Sojourner or anything else. Uh, So I don't actually play a ton of card games or roguelikes i don't know if i can answer that <laughs> but uh for science like we did actually have this conversation conversation of like you know does it need to be cards could we represent this with something else and cards definitely took some of the load off of like having to explain like why are your abilities only sometimes available to you and like why do they go on cooldown? But when they're cards, it's like, oh, I just didn't draw that. And like, people understand the concepts of like, you draw a hand from a deck and you play cards and they get shuffled into the deck. And like, it was just like, okay, with cards, we don't need to explain any of that. Like, players just accept that that is how this works and they don't really question it. Right. I mean, I think, I think, um, well, there are two, two parts of that question that I think, um, I think one part is like, is a deck building game more accessible than a typical card game where you have to assemble a deck like Hearthstone? And like, I think, yes, like definitely it is because the game is guiding you to assemble the deck, right? And assembling a deck is really complicated, but here the game teaches you to assemble it. I think the other part of it though, which is maybe a lot bigger is thinking about just card based roguelikes versus other roguelikes. And I think one of the things that's incredibly powerful about cards is they tell you where the levers are in the game as a player. Like I know if I can only play cards and I have cards and the opponent has cards, that's the system. These are the parts of it. Whereas if you're playing something like Brogue, which is a very complicated roguelike, you know, You've got the randomness of like what all the items are. You've got the different kinds of flora and fauna. You've got moving, just the mechanics of moving. And there are different ways to move. You've got all the things that can like all the interactions between all of the different kinds of flora and fauna. And like, there are so many parts that like you actually, it's like, first it's overwhelming. And then you sort of decide like, okay, well, I'll only pay attention to this stuff. And then you're spending the whole game being like, am I pay attention, paying attention to the right stuff? Am I losing? Cause I didn't think about the way that the dry grass effects with fire. Like there's a thousand systems. And I think cards have a really coherent, like singular way that they just take everything down and they sort of force designers and players to just look at the cards and that's the system. That's the whole thing. You don't have to worry about anything else. Um, Obviously that's not always true, right? Like in the game that you made, there's way more than cards, right? There are all these other systems on top of it, but because it, it focuses so strongly on the cards, like, and those systems all reduce down into the cards. I think it gives people something to like look at and sort of understand and, um, very easily. I, I think that's a really big part of game design that people don't talk about a ton is just like how the system itself flags the components of the system to players so that players can understand them. Um, and that's really like if you're get really into tutorials or just thinking about like how a game will communicate itself to players and explain itself. That's really like what all of that stuff is about. One of the conversations, once, once I started grokking the system a little bit better and realizing like what I could do with the extra abilities that you can attach to cards, I started realizing that if I had a lot of chatter cards, 
I could basically quote unquote dominate a conversation, <laughs> which is very, you know, when you're, when you're a chatterbox, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Did you, so I, and these were like, what, like I wrote this in the notes, I call these like dynamic archetypes because they're not, they don't feel hard coded at all. They feel very emergent from the system. Did you, was that a thing that you were going for when you were designing the special abilities? I, I mean, not specifically, a lot of them started with like, just what abilities would be fun? What abilities, um, you know, it's important that any card could be played anytime. Like it might be a bad play, but we didn't want you to like have to worry about discarding a card because you had nothing playable. Um, but yeah, I mean, as we played, we definitely found like, oh, if you have a deck of all chatters or of all accommodates and it's like, that has a clear meaning, right? Like if it's, you know, we had these encounters where it's you and Elias just playing accommodate, accommodate, accommodate. And it's like, you're both just kind of nodding and smiling and like not actually saying anything to each other. <laughs> um, but like you said, with chatter, yeah. like, yeah, you can just dominate the conversation. Um, and then in turn, if, you know, that means you have fewer options of cards to take because you haven't let the other person say anything, you're not like able to right. gain as much. Um, and so it all kind of like, the, you know, Oh my God, I didn't even think about that implication. So even though like you can build these really like OP kind of decks, like, <laughs> That's fine. So That's... it was when I did it, I realized I was doing it and I didn't even think about the systemic implications, but on a narrative level, I felt like that's not the character I want to be. So I started overwriting chatter when I got new abilities to better role play the character. That's right? and, and maybe that's like a good transition. I like, I like the idea of being socially building. OP, by the way. Well, because <laughs> you're, just, you're basically Conversationally building, OP. Like you're building the whole card stack without the other player, your, your cooperative player saying anything or like putting any cards in it. I mean, you're still having the conversation in between, but they're not contributing to the um, concordant conver or discordant conversation, right? Which again, I was like, I was playing this and I was like, what, how, what, how did this, how does this work? Right. Like the whole time I was just like, and now you saying, well, I haven't like, haven't played a whole lot of uh, tabletop deck builders. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> like you're not weighed down. This is a thing that Zach and I have been talking about for like the greater part of the last decade. Right. You're not weighed down by this baggage of the history of deck building. Games, yeah. Right. <laughs> right? And it's amazing. It's absolutely like, I'm, I'm totally in awe of it. I have a couple of other things I'd like to talk about with respect to world building and, and how those things fit together with the mechanics. But I think Nick wants to move on to, I think I can put that in at the end. Yeah. Yeah. We could talk about that. I think I just wanted to, um, just cause I think the, the vibe of the game also yeah. is very like singular and, and set, has a sort of sets a really nice setting to have these conversations in. And we had um, this question from a Houston via Twitter. who just said the world of signs of the Sojourner is fascinating. And I would love to hear about the main inspirations behind the setting, environmental character designs and so on. Yeah. So a lot of it, like I said, started kind of with, um, wanting to kind of explore what it means to travel to like you know find new communities um and a lot of that just came from our own experiences of uh you know living and working in other countries and then then returning home and kind of what that change is like uh and that's kind of the one through line like through all of our different prototypes and iterations where you know sometimes it was much more grounded like you move to the big city for a job and that's it. Um, other times it was for a while, it was much more of like a folktale hmm. driven world and like um, where you're, you know, you're sure traveling from town to town, but yeah, really like exploring kind of all the different reasons why people travel and, you know, what it means to kind of build a community or find a new home or return home um, was a big, you know, was kind of the driving force on the narrative side. Um thinking about like specific specific uh influences yeah i think the world is very like i mean you're in this sort of just like sort of decaying desert world that's like on its way out in some ways or at least some of the towns i feel i feel like it's a very it's a very like specific vision and you have the story expressed through uh like your mom uh sort of being a traveler in the space before you and sort of meeting people that she met like that all feels like a very yeah, it just, it just struck me as... Uh... So partly just in terms of like thematically um, to kind of have travel kind of, I guess, feel more impactful. The idea that like this is a world where, you know, communication isn't instantaneous. That would kind of like, I think, undermine a lot of the like 
you're encountering a new place that's all completely alien to you, right? Like you, you couldn't like go Google this town before you visited. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that kind of led to like, okay, it's, you know, we didn't want it to be dark and gritty, a lot like post-apocalypse. I guess it's kind of like post, post-apocalypse. Um, but it was just a lot of conversations about like what kind of themes are important to us. Um, you know, climate change was definitely one and that really fit well because like, you know, we're going to be facing a whole lot of climate refugees. Um, We already are. And like, that's obviously a very big reason for why people travel. um, This this game's going to like become a simulation over the next like 30 years. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it really, a lot of it just came through like, what are the reasons people travel? Like, yeah, you know, we have been fortunate to travel like for really positive reasons as tourists or, you know, doing like study abroad things. But, you know, a lot of people are, you know, traveling because of, you know, climate or, you know, war or um, just seeking, you know, different opportunities. And yeah. so kind of trying to think of, like, obviously this is super broad, but, like, representing these different reasons for traveling and mm-hmm. reasons for having to move around. And we tried to, like, you know, in the characters in the game, um, represent a lot of these different, you know, kinds of travel and right. And what it means for these people to be, you know, settling in new places. You know, and I, I don't know if there's a, maybe this is a similar answer, but um, I was curious about some of the aesthetic direction you gave for the game. I recently uh, met your composer, Steve Pardo. I think the, uh, I met him sort of outside of uh, meeting you for this podcast. Um, and I thought the music was phenomenal. And so I was very excited to meet him. I was like, oh my God, you said this, you scored since this year. He did dinner. such an amazing job. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. And it, it fits really well. And I'm, I'm just wondering what sort of direction uh, you gave him and the extended team to sort of like hew to this vision you had for it. Because it does feel, uh, it does feel very cohesive. Um, yeah, so well, with Steve, it was, um, like, I, I don't have a great vocabulary for talking about music, so it was a lot of, like, you know, here's, here are the kinds of things that I like and feel like a good fit. Um, a lot of kind of, like, instrumental, um, I think Andrew Bird was, like, a big one, uh, but really once we, his, the first piece he did was for, like, an early t- uh, trailer that we had, that was kind of, like, establishing, like, the general themes, and then we basically, like created a brief of all the locations kind of what they should feel like all the characters and like what their deal is and then really just talking through it and i mean this largely was coming from him of like um yeah this town is like struggling but kind of on the upswing so like how do you reflect that in music and then um you know at like one example of like adding kind of character layers was uh with Nadine being so intimidating, um, originally she had like a layer that really fit with that. And then as he actually played further in the game and saw that like, oh, she actually, you know, isn't just this like intimidating, like she does have, she does kind of end up helping you. Um, it was like, well, now I really want to soften her. And so he had this like flute element to when you're talking to Nadine that's like subtle, but it's like kind of eases up a little bit on her roughness. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, a lot of it was like, yeah, here are the kind of narrative like overview, and then he really drove a lot of you know the specifics of how to represent yeah you know, these narrative goals in the music. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well. Well. Uh, assuming the soundtrack is up somewhere, we will link to that in the show notes for sure. Yes, it is. I, I have a bunch of of random questions that are maybe never particularly um, flow into a bowl. Um, one problem I always have with, uh, games is naming them. I think naming games is really quite (laughs) difficult. Um, and this game has a really good name. That's, it's very evocative and it is like directly connected to the mechanics. How did you come up with the name? Thanks. That was really difficult. I also hate naming things. (laughs) (laughs) It's my greatest weakness. Um, and I don't like, I don't know if, people sojourner is really hard to say like everyone stumbles over how to say that i'm not sure it was the right choice but uh yeah i mean once we figured out it was about traveling and matching symbols um i don't i don't know if we had like a process for landing on it it was just painful like weeks and months of throwing out ideas and like how can we thematically tie it in Um, were there any names that were close that you didn't go with Oh gosh, I 
I'd have to look. I can't remember. I know. Signs of the chatterbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know we had some like um, placeholder like project names. At one point it was Project Hikate or something. She was like the goddess of travel or something. But like that was another word none of our playtesters could say or like had any idea how to pronounce. Um, which I guess we should have. I guess the lesson is to say your game name out loud a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do think, I do agree that Sojourner is hard to pronounce in, in an unfamiliar word, but I, I also felt like most of the times that I saw it, I saw it in print and, you know, especially, you know, seeing it in the pandemic. And it's a very visually interesting word and it's very memorable. Um, like I definitely, before I was really keyed into this game, it's definitely a game where I was like, oh yeah, I've seen people talking about that. Like I, I didn't forget when I saw it. So I, I do that's, think it was really good, good in that way. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a lame question, but I'm just really interested to know is, uh, do you have a favorite character in the game? I, oh, this is tough. Um, I think probably Klaus is my favorite She's just, she's the, the thief, spoilers, um, who you can kind of, you know, follow. I don't know if any of you, like, followed her thread all the way through, but... I, yeah. I don't I know tried. if it's all the way through, but I definitely tried. Yeah, I think I left off, I think one of my things I didn't get to finish was, like, go see Klaus here, and I think I didn't actually finish that quest, but, yeah. Yeah, she's just, yeah, I don't know, her character is so, like, shameless and... Mm flirtatious and yeah she's great <laughs> I, kept, I kept meeting like i kept discovering new towns that i could go to and meeting new characters and i was like pretty sure this was gonna be it and then i, I just i feel like i kept going which was a really nice feeling and it was also nice like uh kind of like thug was saying of like having these stakes and not like knowing that i wasn't gonna meet everyone and i couldn't fit everything on my calendar uh, yeah I i'm actually curious that. about that right because i i got i got so distracted by the side stories which i don't even know if they're side stories right they were things that felt to me like oh this is meaningful like um the whole story around following in the footsteps of your mother and figuring out what your mother was about was like the thing that i wanted to focus on and as a result i just went really hard on that and there were places that i didn't ever see and I was just curious, even for like the rest of the crew here, because we haven't talked. I finished the game last night and I haven't talked to anyone here about it. And also, you know, we try to not spoil it for the for the listeners. But I'm wondering how many people had that same experience. Like, I think uh, T- Tozenda Falls, or I, I think I'm getting the name wrong. There's like one place in the upper right corner. I never even found the road to get to it. Right. Because I never focused on that part of the world as much because I felt if I it felt like tight enough around the five trips that if I don't focus on my mom's story, I might miss it. And it was very important to me. So this is actually a question. I don't know if this is like a how did your playtesters experience this Diala, but also like to Doug, Zach and Nick, like, did you feel like you like, did you miss towns? Did you not connect the whole map? Did that happen to you as well when you were playing it? Because yeah, I, I, didn't... I don't know if I missed towns. I feel like I had well, everything. I, no, there, I here's the thing: I knew of a town, and I was yeah. never able to to find. Oh, the that's true. There was to one the on town. the top. There was one on the top right of the map. So, yeah, that same, I, okay, yeah, same here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I had the same experience. Interesting. And I, to hijack you slightly, Andy, like I was curious how you scoped the game because I feel like it's something where you could have easily kept going and made it this massive world but it feels really nicely scoped both the size of the map and the amount of discoveries and then doing it um with a very finite amount of runs you have like five runs out into the world and it, or five or six and they yeah change quite a bit each time like we've talked about going home so i was curious sort of how you drew that line was that intentional from the start or was that like a budgetary thing or like where did you cut that off because i think the balance feels really good yeah i mean it was lo- largely driven by just resources like originally we were planning for, um, I think, like, seven or nine trips, and um, that, like, quickly became way too much. But at the same time, like, the concern was if you have too few trips, like, is that enough to actually have, like, a, you know, a full star- story arc that feels, like, complete? Um, and same thing with the characters uh, and, and locations is, you know, there was, we had planned, like, a whole bunch more, and then it kind of again, mostly just because of resources. It was like, we need to scope this back. So like, what is, you know, playing around a little bit with like, what is needed to make it feel like there's enough in each region to keep you engaged, Mm -hmm. um, enough characters just like you have the opportunity to gain 
the cards you need to be able to keep progressing. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much all driven by yeah limited resources and having to scope oh, back kind of these yeah. additional Con- constraints. <laughs> constraints are great. It's and, such a yeah. good constraint to have. Like I felt yeah. it was like so the. For example, like you didn't have to display how many trips were left, but you did. And that must, I mean, I can only assume that that was a conscious decision. Yeah, it was. um, I think it's, you know, it's important to like for players to understand what they're getting into. If, if you know that you're coming up towards the end of like your, you know, the attempts you get to save your store, you know, if, if it's just, one day it's like, okay, bam, the game's over, you failed, like, that feels really bad. You want to know that, like, you're getting towards the end, you need to either, you know, step up your efforts or, you know, wrap up the storyline and and see the end coming. I could not agree more, but you know probably very well that a lot there are a lot of games that don't do that. Well, I also <laughs> love that you actually wrap it up and have an ending, and then it takes you back to the title screen, it's like you want to start a new game go for it whereas this very easily could have been a game where you just dump back into the world afterwards and it's like fine go finish those quests go have those conversations but that just wouldn't fit with the way the game is structured and i really that's like exactly the kind of game i want to play right now is like a very finite thing and when it's done it's done and i like can move on and i just and, that. and when you do it and when you finish a trip you know that there's oh there's five more of these this so i have like mm-hmm. an approximation of how long yeah. this game is going to be by the way, just for, just because we didn't talk about this at all, you also get to decide when you come back home, right? So it's not like a prescribed a prescribed trip through the thing. To a point. Well, I mean, okay, so what I'm saying, yes, and what I'm trying to get to is <laughs> the more you travel, the more you clutter your deck with fatigue cards. And, then the, <laughs> and because when you come back home, you don't get to rest first. You first yeah. have a conversation and you have it with all the trash fatigue cards you're just pissing deck. everyone off when you get home and yeah. everyone's like what are you talking about like man you probably like i don't understand a word you're it's and it's uh, and it, again i'm gushing too much um it's uh fascinating right so there were trips that i cut short because i wanted to have a better experience coming home it had it happened to me i should have done that <laughs> um that was just one of those things that we uh we we wanted to limit how far you could go but like and eventually, you know, we have to like have just a pop up that sends you home if you refuse to go home. But it was one of those things that we wanted it to be like player driven and not, um, you know, on the one hand, we don't want you to stay out for the full 50 days because you're probably going to be failing a lot at the end there. Um, but we wanted to be player driven. And so the fatigue cards adding up uh, really well, for the most part, well, for that, a lot of people just kind of ignore that and get so many fatigues <laughs> this is I, I would i used to watch my ex play stardew valley and like she would be uh she'd like play until her character fell asleep and like it always seemed like such an awful way to like end the day and i was like no you gotta go back go back and like go to sleep properly but now i like i did the exact same thing in your game where i just got fatigued until i was like forced home on my road trip so oh man on, on the flip side of the scope question you know this game uh i think you released it almost a year ago um, initially right on steam. And, um, I was just wondering if there are things that, that you came up with that didn't make it into the game, or if in reflection, there are things that, that this game has gotten you really excited about either for a future game or for things that you thought, Oh, you know, if I, if we'd only done, done it that way, that would have been even more exciting. Yeah, I think there was there. I mean, there's a lot of that we couldn't get to that. I would have loved to, um, some of that is kind of quality of life stuff, like uh, being able to plan your routes better on the map screen. I know that that can be like really frustrating when you can't, you don't know how long it will take to get somewhere. Um, or just like having like an ending gallery so you can kind of keep track of what you've done on previous playthroughs and, um, you know, skipping through tutorials, that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of kind of what like, I think would have had less of an impact of that, but that was like something I really wanted was for a while we were going to have the different outcomes of each conversation would be influenced by um, the specific shapes that were played the most. So like, what does it mean if you have concordance when being like a really diplomatic person versus like a really Mm. um, stubborn person? And like that would have, you know, we actually, some of the earlier conversations do have that, but like it very quickly became clear that like the writing was just (laughs) way too much. Um, But you know, that's like, with infinite time, I would have loved to do that. And, like, I don't know if players might not have even really noticed it. It would have had, like, not been super impactful. But it was just, like, 
I, I still want to do it. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a smart, seems like a smart cut to, to make it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think though, I think like one of the things that sort of has come out in this conversation is that I think one of the things that's really so brilliant about this game is that you manage to take that kind of thing that would be in a game that does you know, evolve into spiraling endless spider webs of conversations and put it in a mechanical context so that players could still get those feelings of like being a chatterbox and dominating the conversation or not knowing how to relate to somebody um, because they've changed and without having the spider webbing. Like you did the thing, I think very much that you set out to do, which is like use these cards and design the system that's going to be a conversation and going to feel like a conversation. And you have just enough text in there to support that um, and, and drive from yeah. the mechanics. So, you know, I think, I don't think, no no biggie that you didn't get that one, <laughs> one part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like we, so in the last five to 10 years, I think in, in indie games specifically, but also in games in general, I think a lot of people have come to the realization that sometimes, not always, like a game that is pretty narrative heavy doesn't need to have like a ton of mechanics to be a really great game. Like we're playing Kentucky Route Zero right now. And when in on that show, we discussed that earlier versions of it had puzzles and then they took them out. Right. And likewise, when a game is more mechanical, it is usually more or often more thematic and less like explicit narrative. And I think one of the reasons we haven't seen a whole lot of that is because people, it's not because people didn't try. It's because people tried and figured out that it's very hard to get right. right? It's extremely hard to figure that out. So this is just me saying your game is a Brett is when I played it, I was like, it's possible. Right. I was just like, Oh, look, Oh, look, it's possible. It's hard, but it's, possible right so and i think and that, that that's like the highest praise i can give you i think the game is fantastic thank you yeah i have i hadn't played this game before and i was like playing it and i was like this is i can't believe i don't know about this game mm -hmm. right so all i can say to our listeners everyone listening right now trust me you will like this game you should please 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 go out and play signs of the sojourner it's fantastic thank you well, uh, in the spirit of the game, let's wrap our conversation, uh, wrap up, wind down our final trip um, and say thank you to Diallo for your generous time and talking us through, uh, talking us through your design process. And for making this great game. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. <laughs> it was great talking with you guys. Awesome. Uh, well, folks listening can find more information uh, about our show at eggplant.show. You can tweet at us at Eggplant Show uh, on Twitter. Um, we will also tag uh, Echo Dog Games and uh, other things we talked about in our show notes there. Uh, you can email us at theeggplantshow at gmail.com. Join our community and uh, chat with us at discord.gg slash eggplant. Um, we're about to break 1,200 uh, members there. So that's exciting, including a lot of previous guests. Um, Patreon.com slash eggplant show, our freshly launched Patreon, which should hopefully be up by the time you hear this, um, where you're free to support us if you like. Eggplant eggplantshow.bandcamp.com for our theme music, youtube.com for uh, slash eggplant show uh, for some archive streams from twitch.tv slash eggplant show. The fatigue cards, Nick. Uh, yep, I know. <laughs> <laughs> They're adding up. Um, I need to go home and <laughs> rest them. Uh, where anyway, Andy, Andy streams most mornings. Um, leave us a voicemail. We haven't had those in a few weeks. Uh, 312 809-9680. We would love some of those. Uh, join us next week back here for part five, the final part of our Kentucky Route Zero miniseries um, before we interview the devs for uh, sort of a uh, extra episode after that. Um, and please leave us an iTunes review or tell a friend about the show. That helps us out a lot. So thanks to everyone listening. Thanks again to Diala for the time and take us out, Dose One. <laughs>